Hi, my name is Hunter Kempf and I'm a Z by HP Global Data Science Ambassador and a data scientist. Uh, I'm going to go through today an introduction to generative art with stable diffusion presented by HP. So a quick agenda here for, for the topics we'll cover. Uh, first, we'll go over a model architecture overview, some ethical considerations, some practical considerations, then a getting started chunk, as well as uh, kind of a more in-depth optimization chunk and uh, some workflow or some app examples. So first we'll go through basically a, a general model ar architecture overview. And first we'll look at a timeline here of basically from December, 2017, when uh, the first transformer model architecture was described in a paper uh, that was basically transformative to the way a lot of people did and, and thought about uh, machine learning and especially um, these large language models and then turned into um, being applied also to image tasks as well. So uh, attention is all you need was the first paper uh, developed by folks at Google. And then BERT was kind of an implementation of that transformer architecture, came out in 2018. And Dolly uh, out of OpenAI was really um, that transformer architecture uh, ideas applied to kind of a text image task. And Stable Diffusion was an open source version of that text image transformer model, um, uh, basically uh, applied on images. And Stable Diffusion, as you can see here by the release date, is very, very new. So uh, all the resources we're talking about you know, are, are out as of this year and really you know, out as of a couple months ago. There's plenty of new versions and um, additional projects that are, are coming out kind of around uh, supporting this uh, initiatives as well. So quick view at the attention is all you need uh, paper and kind of the important stuff coming out of it. Uh, so yeah, again, you can look at, at the title page of the paper here on the left and uh, it came out in December of 2017 and really mostly, you know, folks from Google there um, working on, on that project. And on the right here, we have a view of kind of in a diagram what that uh, important you know, transformer model architecture was. And, and really the important things to look at here are um, these multi-attention, uh, multi-head attention, multi -head attention um, blocks, as well as kind of the concept of an encoder block and a decoder block, um, which, you know, this here was applied for uh, language tasks. And we'll see uh, additionally, um, kind of how these similar core concepts are um, added into some of the more uh, visual tasks. So we can go here to the next one, which is high image, uh, high resolution image synthesis with latent diffusion models. This is really the paper uh, that stable diffusion came out of. And again, we have kind of the a, a cross attention here um, and an encoder and decoder um, to the latent space. Uh, very similar if we you know, go back encoder and decoder. Um, and uh, yeah, the cross attention blocks we have, really, you know, you don't need to fully understand this to be able to use the model, but good to understand that that concept of attention um, is basically throughout all these transformer models, quite important. So now we've seen a, a little brief view of that model overview. Um, we'll jump into here a section on ethical considerations. So really for using any of these generative models, um, it's important to understand what they're trained on. And so uh, the stable diffusion model here is trained on the LAION data set. 
And this data set is basically a list of, kind of indexes of web images with uh, associated text to them. You can see uh, kind of print out visualizations here of some of the image sizes and, and the text length uh, uh, around it. And then uh, up on the left over here, we can see kind of a view of some of those like images that, that can be pulled out through a clip retrieval tool. But really the important thing to maybe note here is that what the, this data set is basically just a, a, an index of all of the images from the web. These are you know pulled from, in this view, maybe uh, something like funnycatsgif.com or any other website. So really it's making use of all this data on the internet and the researchers who are pulling it really have to be careful uh, to train their models using images they have the rights to, or um, that they're maybe um, you know uh, that they should be using uh, to try not to use to, uh, copyrighted images. And I think this is really maybe where some of the gray area can come in. Of not every model will be trained uh, on fully open uh, in the, the public domain images. And so I think understanding that and really, you know, as you use the outputs of it, I think it's important to know, okay, if I put in exactly the right query for French cat, the right seed, the right blend of, of information or hipster cat or one of these things, I may come out with something that really resembles or maybe you know almost exactly is one of these images and that is a concern with transformer models and i think something uh to be aware of if you're going to use these for any sort of generative art that you're planning on making money off of and and really uh yeah trying i think to realize that point there of the training set being from kind of public images off the internet. And we could see this again here in, in another example would be uh, the stable diffusion models have the ability to use an input image. And so um, here's a very simple example from the um, stable diffusion GitHub where you see basically a single input image and generating kind of a couple lookalikes. Uh, the thought here um, around ethics would be if this fairly simple drawing here was say a famous work of art or a you know another piece of art that an artist um, created i think you really start to get into kind of a moral quandary or or issues around using someone else's art even if you put kind of this filter on top of it, that's the stable diffusion model. You really should, uh, for your input images, I think uh, it's a little less of a gray area. The training data may, may be more, but these input images that um, you're using to kind of set the weights of the initializations of the model um, really you, you know, should be stuff that you built yourself or that is in public domain. Um, so not taking someone's half finished art, so let's say, and, uh, finishing it yourself. And so, um, that leads us into a couple of examples of, um, articles in the news around these ethical considerations. Uh, the first one here is around a user who, who took, um, a, you know, half finished drawing from someone that was doing a live stream of a drawing and uh, used a similar tool to Stable Diffusion to kind of finish out that uh, model and then came back and, and kind of was demanding credit from that artist that was working on it on the live stream. Uh, you know, obviously this sort of uh, concept here is really something that's um, like, has no place really in, in, um, in the, AI kind of 
generative art world because you're just stealing from that creator. You, you use you know their input image and that is their copyright and and then directly basically try to finish and, and claim credit for it as your own original work. So that right there is a, a peak example of something um, that really is kind of wrong in, in the generative art space. So if you are just getting into it, I would say avoid anything resembling this uh, and really start your images from a text input or you know from your own source material. And another view here on the right, we can see a similar model, um, another transformer model where uh, in this case, a user's copyrighted content was basically regurgitated out from a transformer model with uh, the copyright you know, stripped out. And so I think this is another warning here of understanding the inputs that a model was trained on because granted, I think it's a little more you know, difficult in, in a visual view to, to have this similar um, pull out, but yeah, you can see basically his code on the left and then uh, what comes out of a transformer model that was trained on a bunch of code from GitHub uh, on the right. And really, again, this is something that you as a user should, should have some level of concern about, um, but it's really more for those that are kind of fine tuning or training any of these uh, models as to the inputs they're using and, and how they're used. And finally here, we'll go uh, and, and see that really that concept of training sets for, for these sort of visual tasks um, in the public domain, people are having those conversations on uh, where kind of the, that, where to draw the line. Obviously as humans, we see a bunch of art and we can create something in the style of something else and it's not an issue, but um, we, when an AI does it at scale, maybe it becomes a bigger issue. I think these are things that we're still as a community and, and, and legally determining and, and understanding. Uh, so practical considerations, now that we kind of have a brief overview of those ethical uh, views, we can kind of jump into a couple of things on if you need to uh, you know, run this model, uh, what are the minimum specs, maybe some good specs and some great specs for, for what your computer will look like. And uh, for, for the stable diffusion models, they're pretty large in terms of uh, the model footprint on, on your graphics card. And you'll see here, we really are touching mostly on graphics cards because the, uh, the model should pretty much just be run on a graphics card. You can try to run it on a CPU, it'll be very slow. And that slowness will really hurt the creative process of working with these uh, generative art models. So really the, the minimum specs would be something like a GTX 1060 with um, six gigs of video memory. Something good would be something like a 3080 Ti. Something great would be something uh, maybe like an RTX A6000 with you know plenty of video memory. So you can run a bunch of these um, in parallel and, and really, I think that's where these sorts of models get off and running really well is something with, you know, around, let's say 16 to 20 gigs or more of video memory. And you're really going to be able to use the model to kind of the fullest extent. And, uh, so basically for, for my use case, I am sponsored by uh, Z by HP. And so I have a Z book studio and a Z eight G four. Um, you can see basically some of the video cards that are, that are in those for my machines and basically want to say that I've tested this uh, stable diffusion models on both those and they work great. Uh, it's, I think, a very big plus, again, to have something like the A6000 in my desktop um, really to basically make this workload run faster and just better in terms of, uh, we'll see a couple things later uh, where I ran basically eight images in parallel and in 40 seconds I have the output instead of, you know, if I'm running it on a CPU, it would probably be something on the order of 
15, 20 minutes before I start to get one image. Um, so really, you know, GPU and bigger video memory are going to be really helpful for, for these sorts of tasks. Uh, so we'll look again here at the uh, Z by HP lineup. And if you want to do this on uh, one of the Z by HP laptops, I suggest uh, a ZBook Studio or a ZBook Fury. Um, they both have kind of the option for those uh, better laptop GPUs that can really kind of handle this model. And uh, if you're going to do it on a, a desktop uh, variant, then they all pretty much can, can be equipped with the proper GPUs to support it. All right, so now that we've gotten a couple of those things out of the way, we can um, go into kind of the getting started here. And really the important stuff to, to talk about here is installing kind of the proper software. Z by HP has a, a really pretty nice uh, offering here that's open source and, and available to download, uh, which is the stack manager. And, and that basically you can kind of install and, and know that things will work together, the different packages that you uh, click in and, and install there and uh, kind of get started fast. If you want to install stuff yourself, you can also um, do that, obviously. Uh, the required libraries for this will be PyTorch, Diffusers, Transformers, uh, OpenCV, and FTFY. I think the the ones most people will, will know will be PyTorch, and then um, really Diffusers and Transformers are kind of uh, out of the, uh, they're open source out of uh, Hugging Face, and really kind of help you to work with diffusion models and transformer models, and then uh, OpenCV for, for computer vision and FTFI for Unicode uh, issues. And after you have those required packages, you're basically going to need to download the model. And uh, I've used for this demo, the version 1.4, and I think version 1.5 is just recently out. So, um, you could check that out, but if you want to kind of follow along with the seeds and the examples that I have uh, and, and recreate a lot of the stuff that I have, then something like 1.4, uh, th this here, Stable Diffusion 1.4, should be um, what I used. And, and you basically need to create an account on Hugging Face and uh, log in, and, and then you can uh, download that, that model checkpoint. So the other piece is... Uh, the that really makes working with stable diffusion a lot easier is called stable diffusion web ui it's a github repository and i think has quite a few different uh contributors but the link is down here on github and then it's automatic 1111 stable diffusion web ui and you get kind of a very nice uh view with some sliders kind of a dashboard here that you can uh kind of trade and, and tweak all the, the different uh, values and variables. And this really um, is how I interact with Stable Diffusion most of the time. I think it just makes life a lot easier to have uh, a lot of this stuff. You can see even down here, you kind of have uh, something that tells you kind of how long it took to run, as well as how much memory is being used and uh, like the prompt and how many steps you're running something for, the sampler you're using. So if you want to be very consistent with kind of logging all of your info, you can basically just copy and paste something uh, like this every single time you're running some uh, a different version of, of any of these things. And you can kind of collect the seed and, and get the um, reproducible results out of, out of the, the model. And, and so, yeah, this really helpful. This is the text to image view. There's also an image to image and an upscaling view. So um, really this web UI is kind of my number one suggestion on getting started and uh, a useful tool for uh, stable diffusion. So we'll now get into a section of, let's say you've set up stable diffusion, you kind of have the required packages and, and you're really trying to understand, okay, what does what a good query look like and how do I maybe improve upon a query or an image that I've already created? 
And so we'll go through some te tips and um, some tricks and, and kind of techniques and hopefully give you a little bit of a better idea on how to take your queries from kind of basic to a higher level. And really, here's kind of a couple of small tips. First thing would be to start really simple. So if you have kind of a general idea, you can put something in and just start generating images, see what out of your query the model's picking up and kind of maybe what it's not picking up and try to maybe adjust from there. The next thing would be really logging your seeds, parameters, any input images you use so that you can reproduce uh, your work. I think treating stable diffusion in kind of a scientific way will help you uh, to not only grow in your ability to query things, um, but also just to help you with, let's say you created a really cool image and you clicked rerun or you, you changed the query a little bit and you wanna go back to it, then if you really kind of log your work well, um, you'll be able to really reproduce any of the images you have directly out of the model. This could be maybe also important if there's some sort of question as to um, how you came to create the work that you created. And so I think it's important to, to just really keep that those notes there um, for reproducibility. And then, you know, as you start to get more familiar, I and if you have a better GPU running uh, with additional kind of details to the query, as well as higher batch size and counts can really help you to pick out a, a good or great image out of maybe um, a query that you had that's pretty good. But uh, if you run it with a bunch more seeds, you can kind of get some variation and see some, some interesting results. Uh, along with that, maybe some of those more details that you'd add would be a style uh, or an artist. So those basically um, are great at, at kind of helping to change what that uh, output will look like. You know, in the style of Vincent van Gogh will be very different than in the style of Thomas Kincaid, for example. Uh, and really kind of, the, there's plenty of stuff to play with there. And, and most of the artists or, or styles that you're familiar with, unless they're quite niche, should probably be available to you to use in a query. And those will really help find to kind of what you're looking for in, in the model results. Uh, you could also add things like material information, if it's a painting, if it's a, a sculpture, things like that. Um, and I, I think one component to understand about stable diffusion as well would be Prompts where you're expecting some sort of legible words, maybe like a um, a poster or something like that, are going to be very hard to do in stable diffusion. It doesn't really create something like a word very well. It'll create maybe a bunch of you know A B C the the actual letters, but it won't create like a legible word. And so those are probably better done in a tool like Photoshop after the fact. If you want to have, you know, say a poster, you can create the image, but then, um, you know, do some post-processing on top of it to add words. And uh, another piece is you can do something uh, called kind of interrogating an image. So you can import an image into the Stable Diffusion Web UI and basically you run interrogate on it and it will give you its idea of what a prompt would be to generate a similar image. And so um, if you're looking to kind of get examples of maybe how detailed the prompts can get or different artists to use to get something similar to an image, um, th this is a great way of kind of understanding a little bit of uh, how prompts work and how, how to build stuff. Uh, another tip would be to kind of use a workflow similar uh, maybe to something like a, a genetic algorithm where you can start with a text to image prompt, pick your favorite out of that text to image, and then start fine tuning that uh, in an image to image conversion. And really um, kind of each cycle that you run through, you can maybe mask out an area of the image you don't like and ask the model to fill it. You can um, 
maybe you know just pick your favorite image of the eight or 20 or however many images you generate and use that as kind of the starting point for another um, view with maybe the same query or a slightly tweaked query. Really, this is kind of where a lot of the fine tuning of, of any of your results will come. And it's kind of what makes to me stable diffusion a lot of fun to work with. Uh, and also then you know, kind of uh, with the image to image, you can really play with denoising strength, which is how much the image to image algorithm focuses on the input image versus the text input. And so you can basically with a lower uh, denoising strength kind of make some light tweaks or a higher denoising strength, take maybe the concept that's shown in the image and really put it in a quite different uh, environment. So that denoising strength is a really powerful tool and it, uh, you know, you, for, for whatever you're trying to do, you're going to probably have to play around with it. Maybe um, start with a little bit uh, higher than as you start to get an image that you're uh, enjoying and, and kind of want the composition to pretty much stay the same. You can move it lower and then have some slight tweaks to it. So here's a couple of examples we'll get into of kind of what uh, the input text and maybe uh, what the output are or for, for a workflow that, that I used. This image actually used in this slide deck, I think uh, if you're paying attention, you may have already kind of noticed, but all of the transition slides have uh, some sort of artwork and that artwork was all generated in stable diffusion. So um, if you're looking for, you know, how to replicate an image like this here, uh, I have the seed, the sampling steps, sampling method, and, and other variables that are useful to kind of recreate this image here uh, in the stable diffusion uh, version 1.4. And so my input text for this was robot standing in frontier landscape, looking at the horizon, painting. And you could really see basically, okay, here's a robot. You know, kind of looking out into an area that um, you know has a bunch of hills and you know, is it painting? And if we want to interrogate it, we could see what is the you know query that the model thinks could generate you know a similar image to this. And it's a robot standing in the desert with a person walking by it, sky uh, in the background with clouds and a person walking by it. So you may see um, in this case it's picking, you know, maybe this little red dot here as a person, and it's, um, you know, repeated that twice. This is a piece with some transformer models where it's, you know, not a perfect sentence, but uh, you can clean up, clean this up, but you can also understand maybe that you're, uh, if you repeat things in, in your query, it'll pick up on it more. Um, we'll go through another technique of kind of adding uh, more attention to certain words or removing more attention uh, from other words. And then you'll see uh, here is basically an artist, David A. Hardy, right? So it thinks this painting here could be most similar to the artistic style of David A. Hardy. So if you wanted something similar and maybe um, you're kind of changing slightly or, or you know, kind of want something in a similar vein, you, you may add you know, this by David A. Hardy and get uh, more consistent results or kind of that painting style that you like. Again, if you're looking for other artists, there's uh, additional resources we'll have at the end that are kind of, uh, you know, a, a let's say guide of, of some of the artists you can, can pick to uh, use in these models. Maybe we'll walk through now a little bit of a realistic um, example of, of kind of that second thing I talked about of using almost a genetic algorithm of creating an input, uh, running it uh, through the model, and then picking kind of the best uh, outputs to run back through uh, as inputs. And so let's say I want uh, a man riding on a motorcycle on a highway, beach in the background, um, and a painting. And so I run that through the text to image generator and I get eight different images here. And let's say I like this one on the top right the best. 
but I'm looking here and I see, okay, there's like some sort of motorcycle or, you know, something I don't really want in the background. Also, maybe, you know, as you look, this guy's helmet has something funky going on, um, some sort of maybe not fully finished design, but for the most part, like looks like a pretty good base image. And uh, from there, maybe what I can do would be uh, to inpaint that area that had uh, initially had that kind of item on the beach. And uh, I'll basically, when you're inpainting, you draw kind of a mask over the area and then you ask the uh, model to kind of fill that area, understanding the context of the other pixels around it. Uh, and you'll see basically we have uh, a bunch of blurry uh, components here. And I just picked the one that kind of looked, uh, you know, decently blurred there. And we'll send it back to the image to image model after inpainting. Again, if you want to kind of follow these steps, we have uh, the prompt, the seeds, and, and all the um, values that you would need to kind of recreate something like this. And so the, the next piece we'll talk through in this process is really around denoising strength. So I'll keep the input image and all the other variables pretty much the same. And um, really just change that denoising strength to, to kind of show uh, how that really affects uh, the models. So if we have the denoising strength relatively low, um, you'll see that blur is pretty much still in there. And uh, maybe this one on the bottom is like the best one out of the bunch, but we really still see kind of that gray area instead of like a full white sand beach. And so we can, you know, maybe take the denoising strength up, you know, quite a bit, which will keep the same general um, concept, but maybe it will change things too much. Like now we have uh, what looks like a bunch of um, different sticks in the ground and, you know, maybe we have a runner running by um, and, and, you know, some people on the beach, we have maybe some stuff that we don't want exactly. If the denoising strength goes too high, gives the model a little bit more freedom in terms of um, kind of how it sets the composition. You can see there's now like a boat or maybe an island uh, you know, off the coast. And so maybe what we want is something in the middle. And you, you know, this here, the blur is, is out of this image. And really for most of the images in this uh, you know, denoising de strength of, of 0.4, and we can see, okay, if we go too low, the blur kind of remains, the image is, is pretty much almost exactly the same as the input image. If we go a bit too high, uh, we're losing maybe some of the composition details that we created. Um, and so we can kind of dial it back a little bit and pick something that we're gonna be happy with. And so, you know, this is maybe the output and end result that I was looking for, kind of a clean beachscape with a man on a motorcycle you know, riding uh, by it. And so this, you know, for, for this example, maybe exactly what I was looking for. If it wasn't, maybe I can, you know, maybe I want a full rider. What I could do would be to outpaint. Um, so you basically kind of grab a section of the image and ask Stable Diffusion to fill in whatever that rest of the image. So if you wanted the full uh, rider, you could do something like that. And uh, next, we'll kind of hop into another uh, view we can can look at for optimizing queries. This is pretty new. Um, again, uh, this is actually open source out of Google, and it's called Prompt to Prompt, and it, they have a um, a GitHub repo with it. But you can basically see uh, this is for editing some of the attention that certain words are paid. So you can uh, you know take the boulevards are crowded today and make them slightly less crowded or uh, take an, a prompt that generates an image and add slightly different uh, context to that same image. So um, really it's a pretty cool view with uh, how the prompt to prompt works. It takes the prompt and edits the attention through uh, throughout and they have yeah the ability to add or subtract um, words as well as 
the ability to kind of add, uh, like increase the attention or decrease the attention that certain words are paid in that input prompt. And so, yeah, again, if you want to read uh, the article um, here, it's prompt to prompt image editing with cross attention control uh, out of some folks in Google research. And again, the source for the GitHub is in the slides here. Uh, really cool new tool that can kind of be used for really that fine tuning of uh, a query with, with stable diffusion. And maybe one of the other things to, to look at here would be the concept of a prompt builder. I think this is probably more useful for people that are just getting started, but uh, basically it's a kind of visual uh, block by block builder of um, some details and maybe some hints for artist style. It's a drop down, so you can just click things and add it. Uh, you can kind of see examples and and really maybe go from there of um, understanding it. And yeah, so you can can kind of see here's the link for it. Uh, I think if you're just getting started and don't really understand much about stable diffusion, this might be a great place to to really get started. Uh, we have additional resources here. Uh, the slides will hopefully share at the end, so you can just click on the links. Uh, if not, you can transcribe them from the slides here. But we have a couple of different galleries and then uh, that prompt to prompt uh, view, the prompt builder view, uh, and then this prompt book, which was built for Dolly 2, but works really pretty well in terms of understanding how to create queries for stable diffusion as well. So uh, we're close to time here and we'll run into a little view here of maybe some examples of how you could use stable diffusion in a real world workflow. And um, I, I had an idea here of potentially uh, what a stable diffusion powered photo booth would look like. And uh, so in my view, it would take an input image, which is taken from a camera, um, and has, have a component here that is basically interrogating the photo, but maybe with a ability to tweak this last uh, component of the, the artist that it's by. And so a portrait of a man, you know, by, and I showed a couple of different options that could maybe be uh, useful to understand kind of the difference. And so, um, you know, by Picasso, by Da Vinci, or by Grant Wood. Um, and you see the distinctive artist styles out here. And I think this could be, you know, something where if someone spent a bit more time on it, um, could definitely be a really cool uh, application of uh, stable diffusion, you know, something that the average person could maybe select the artist, take the picture, and get one of these outputs um, you know, back in maybe you know, 40 seconds or, or 50 seconds, whatever the time it takes to run. Um, but really, you know, maybe a cool idea for, for people to kind of further uh, work on. Uh, the uh, next view would be uh, something that people have already done, which is uh, a basically Photoshop plugin for stable diffusion. So uh, how this is mostly um, you think it is basically people will create uh, some sort of image in stable diffusion and they'll be able to edit it in Photoshop, send it back to stable diffusion and kind of make some edits and then continue that loop. So it's a, a you know, bit more control in terms of the elements that come from, you know, maybe one or from multiple images in a round if you're creating eight images in a, a set, you can pick maybe the best elements that you like the most. So if you think of that rider we had, um, you can maybe pick the bicycle or motorcycle from uh, one image and you could pick the beach or sky or the clouds from another image and kind of pick the best in Photoshop, put them together and then send them back in, into stable diffusion for some slight tweaks or some blending. Um, really, you know, I think this is, is a really cool use case for uh, how stable diffusion is used. And um, the last thing is somewhat recent news here uh, where 
uh, Shutterstock is going to be using uh, the Dolly 2 model to create uh, work for basically uh, any of these stock images that, that people search for on Shutterstock. And um, you could do something very similar with uh, stable diffusion, right? So picking kind of the, the best um, of any of the queries, Shutterstock obviously knows what a lot of users are looking for. And so that may be some ability for, for them to uh, work with, but I think also just having a user be able to input kind of whatever they want, be able to pick out some stock images and use them in their slides, similar to kind of how I've done for, for my presentation here of um, taking kind of an, uh, an abstract idea, adding it to a slide and having um, that ability to basically really, uh, you know, enhance any of your slides or presentations without having to go through the, the time and effort of, of fully uh, building out the composition, taking the photos, that sort of thing. Um, and you may recognize this image here as, as one of our example images, but um, we'll hop through the last section here, which is kind of what's next for this space. And in this, I think the big elephant in the room for what's next is going to be uh, videos that are kind of created in the same way that uh, stable diffusion creates images. You can see an attempt here to use uh, stable diffusion models that kind of blend different concepts. So you have like a bowl of spaghetti with strawberries versus with blueberries and they kind of, you know, blend together. This is maybe a more primitive view, but if you look at what Google research and what Meta are doing, um, there's kind of a you know, pretty impressive examples of uh, prompt to uh, videos, especially here looking at the text in, in this uh, image out of, the image gen is out of Google and then make a video is out of uh, Meta. And you can see again, kind of maybe where the next steps for these sort of diffusion models will will come from. And uh, I think it's very exciting. So with that, uh, we will uh, wrap up. And uh, if anyone has questions, feel free to type them in. I should be on during the uh, presentation. So I hopefully can answer some of your questions. Uh, it's been awesome giving this talk. And uh, hopefully you all feel a little more uh, comfortable with the concepts of, of stable diffusion. And I think the big thing, if I can give you a kind of call to action would be uh, go out, download the, the model files, really play with it. And um, I, I think that's where you'll get really, really uh, kind of better results is you can take in the, the things that I've kind of given as tips, but you can also obviously learn more. There's plenty of information, videos and, and resources sort of out there online. But I, I think the way you'll get better with any of this is just by having an idea and then trying to walk through from kind of an idea in your head to writing a good prompt to picking kind of good uh, images and maybe fine tuning those images. So having a real project that you work on for, for any of these things, I think is the best way of, of learning. So thank you very much. Bye.